seven, 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 Are listening to Ultra Q episode 29. Uh, my name is Red. I'm joined by Razan. I'm not a lozenge, I'm Razan. I that is true, that is correct. Uh, still not joined by Mel, uh, who will be back next week. Uh, coming up in Ultra 7, we got wife guy scientists, grumpy scientists, and just the regular ocean battleship Yamato. Yeah. Not the not the one in space, just normal normal sea based Yamato. You gotta build up to it. This is true. This is true. It's like you know the evolutionary charts, you go from sea to land to space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it goes. Um Before we get to any of that, uh I I was just gonna before we get to any you know, like the thing that we've both done. Um, uh, just, just, just a couple, couple, couple of things. Um, I watched a bad anime, uh, because, uh, I dunked on it a while ago and someone I was in a discord with got mad at me because I dunked on it and, um, and said, you have to watch more than two episodes. So I, I watched all 12 episodes of the first season of Sugar Apple Fairy Tale. And is this the weird fairy slavery show? Yeah. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm dunking on it for real now that I've watched it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's not good. It's not good. It's really bad. I don't. I don't know who it's for, because it's it's saccharine and like really soft and like it's it's vibes and it's supposed to be like oh hold you know the nice uh relationship between uh between these two leads um and is also a slavery romance thing and like. <laughs> I would know who this was for if it picked one of those two directions. Like, if it leaned all the way, if it went, like, like 2000s visual novel type level of edgy on, like, leaning into this fucked up uh, dynamic. And, uh, you know, I'd be like, I understand. Like, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily watching this, but I understand why it exists. I understand who is watching it. Um... If it was in the other direction, I would understand who was wanting it. But by being too nice to do anything with, like, it's just, it's like, there's a, there's a certain thing where it's like, the edgy shit can have, it has it in them to actually depict, like, depict the depict the thing honestly um that something that's trying to be pg doesn't it can't do it um and so it's just it wants because like episode one has like the one interesting thing that this show has in it is is in episode one um is that the the fairy shall and shall um is you know she she buys him as like you, you, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with slavery, but I do need a bodyguard for the road, so I'm going to buy you. And I don't, I don't want to be your master. I, you know, I want us to be like equals. Um, and Shao Fan Shao throughout episode one is like, no, I'm not going to do anything unless you order me to, uh, because we're not friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's like that's the one interesting thing the show has going for it, uh, because you know it's mostly just a show about 
how this nice girl is going to overcome fake anime racism um and uh you know she frees her slave but you know her slave sticks around with her for the rest of the show and kind of acts like she owns him and and everyone talks about him like she owns him because she clearly owns him <laughs> Uh, this is this is how it always goes every time this plot happens it's, it's in like, anything it's, i've ever seen it's like th there's like an inkling here of like of like if you thought about this for a second you'd have something which is the other characters keep being keep assuming that she owns him and she keeps going no why does everyone keep assuming this as like because <laughs> you clearly kind of own him still um but uh no, it 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 can't do. It. I was, I was baffled because someone I, you know, someone had, they'd said that there's some like stuff. Episode nine, there's an arc that kicks in where it's got like some social commentary, and I was like, okay, I got to the social commentary. It was mostly about misogyny, and I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> oh. what's, what's happening here? This doesn't seem like a good, uh, a good, a good use of our time. Um, no, I don't, I think it's a a really bad show. Um, oh well. Um, is there a season two? <laughs> there is a season two. I will not be watching. You gonna bother? <laughs> no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Um, it's a shame because like it's a it's a fantasy anime. There isn't there are no isekai elements. It uh like the environments look gorgeous. It's got its own like original like magic setup. Like like fa fairies are born from like items and like moments in the world. Um, like one of the characters was born when uh, a human saw like a drop of dew fall from a leaf or something. Um, and, like, and I was like, "This is th th that that's good." Like that. Uh, unfortunately, it's also just it's a slavery romance. <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard. That's a hard wall to overcome. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I uh, I read something that still that does speaking of the edgy thing can confront the truth i read the first elric uh short story yeah let's go that shit rules um <laughs> god damn elric's so cool uh by not being like like it's like i understand like the, the context of this is um michael moorcock hates hates tolkien's work essentially yes. <laughs> uh thinks it fucking sucks is is like this is the most like trad cath shit in the fucking world <laughs> um turns and, out monarchs not cool <laughs> uh and also awful people also uh parodying like like somewhat of a parody uh of like various sword and sorcery uh, tropes that were going around at the time, um, you know the, the Conan stuff, which you know I I should watch Conan the Barbarian the movie. Um, that seems like a great time. Uh, Honestly, I Conan is a thing that I should probably check out because I have zero interest in it. But I feel like so much stuff I enjoy, like the Moorcock stuff, is a reaction to it. I feel like I owe it to myself to become more familiar. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a YouTuber that I don't follow as closely as I used to because he. Although he's probably he's not talking about D and D as much as he used to because he's designing his own game, uh, but uh, Matt Colville um, talked. Oh yeah, yeah, he talked. I know him. He, yeah, he talked uh, in a series of his. I think it was his a fighter in every uh, edition of D and D to explain the history of D and D because he's been in it since the very beginning. Um, uh, he um, he talked about how. Uh, he used Conan as like an example of a friend of his, the argument he had, which was that the rogue ruined Dungeons and Dragons because, you know, Conan the Barbarian is not a fighter. He is a thief. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's like the, that. And just, I know that, uh, the quote from the, you know, the, the lamentations of their women, etc. quote, um, to see, crush your enemies, see them driven before you. And what is best in life, Conan? Uh, I should watch that movie. Point is, Elric is sick. Uh, just doing, like, metal cover versions of fantasy magic um, at all times. Uh, what a cool dude. Uh, not, you know, asterisk. 
sense. <laughs> he's cool because he sucks so fucking it's, hard. It's so good. Him like staggering back in uh, after summoning a mist and just being like, "Bro, I need f- I need wine, and I'm gonna sit in this <laughs> chair and I'm gonna fucking sleep for a day." <laughs> um, amazing. Him. That's also that sword is so evil the the degree to which yeah, that sword is. is evil is wow that's a that's an evil sword you will now anytime you see a talking evil sword in fantasy will just feel the stormbringer vibes it's mm-hmm. everywhere once you once you see it it's it's all over the place yeah i'm the uh the thing the thing about elric is that the decades have made it annoying to just read it in the right order, which is the order that mm-hmm. it was written. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm having to read individual short stories from different books. Um, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't help. It doesn't help that it seems like the author himself has kind of signed off on the like do it chronologically thing so, he, um, so his his thing is that he's like you should probably start with elric of melnipone which no you shouldn't and he says you should yeah. probably start end with stormbringer and no you shouldn't um i think <laughs> you should i i obviously uh, uh I, I suspect that michael morcop knows that sickos uh like us exist and doesn't really care <laughs> Yeah, I think I I think so too, uh, but it's made every see the thing I think I told you about this on an episode of this podcast where I own a like six volume collection of all the Elric stuff. Yes, those um, pa- those paperbacks with the amazing cover art that were made that are done in order and then also have like essays and writings from people like Alan Moore like weighing in on like the legacy of Elric oh, as a oh, like yes. fantasy f- figure, um, and now those are out of print. And what replaced them, I think, is the thing, like, the stuff in chronological order, which pisses me off. <laughs> oh, it's so annoying. But, um, yeah. you know, I've I've got a list. Um, some, you know, someone gave me a, a really handy list. Uh, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go through and check them off. Uh, read The Dreaming City. Finished that. It was good. That's maybe my favorite one that I've read. Uh oh. <laughs> what? No, just just like just just just, just as in I was just like I yeah I've read my first Elric story. And that's your favorite one. Oh. <laughs> so I'm like oh okay. No, I just I don't know. I vibe with that one a lot. I also just think the like dreaming stuff in that was like mm-hmm. cool. It's also it's been a minute since I read this, but it's... I mean the the classic the the like. Stormbringer itself is also very good, but I, I remember having a fondness for Dreaming City. I am looking forward to working through. I think I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read like the original story because there there is like a Sherlock Holmes type thing where um uh uh because you know at some point uh, Arthur Conan Doyle uh, tried to kill Sherlock Holmes off and then had to bring him back. Everyone knows the story. Uh, uh a similar ish not quite the same thing but basically like the original run of like eight or something short stories is like like the original elric stuff and then everything afterwards is just kind of like fitting it in between uh other uh, and like before other stories and like origin stories and things uh so i'm gonna read those and then i'm gonna just take a break and then dip in and out whenever i feel like it that's probably a good way to do it. See, the fun part about this, like, pulpy short fiction stuff is it's so easy to just pick up and set down whenever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know what happens in Stormbringer? Uh, I mean, I I know that Elric, uh, you know, I, I know that Elric at some point has to die. Okay. I that I think that's the one thing I know about Elric is that he sucks and he's going to die. <laughs> the the final line that Stormbringer has in that book goes fucking hard. <laughs> it's like one of my maybe like favorite villain lines in fiction ever. <laughs> I can't wait. God. It's it's so cool. It's he The more I'm thinking about it, I think Stormbringer might be my favorite actually because oh, he, it He went really robotic there. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. 
Hello. Hello, are you back? I am back. I don't know what the fuck that was. Damn, it's all good. It's all good. All right, where were we? Uh, I You were about to say something that I do not... Something about it being sick. Oh, well that... Oh, I was going to say it's sick when a sword starts screaming at you. Yes. Uh... I'm pretty sure he's in Dream and... Uh, how are you feeling about Moonglum? He's there by now, right? No. I, no, I, re okay. I, read, the, I read the first short story. Okay. Moonglum's a funny little man. You'll meet him soon. Excellent. I love a funny little man. Um, well, that's... Uh, that's, you know, that's Elric. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's a short story. I don't have much. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it's written well. I think it's cool. Um, there's a lot of uh just very high bullshit uh like pulpy just descriptions of, of things it's good um him like walking through the streets of uh the city and like hearing like the sounds of cruelty and wickedness and him being like uh you know what it's it's kind of good to be back <laughs> <laughs> yes yes um may maybe maybe El maybe Elric is about the curse of being British is you can't call you can't shake being British maybe. <laughs> maybe it's maybe maybe it's about uh how monarchy is just in your brain or something I don't know I'll see you gotta check out the blue oyster cult Elric songs after oh shit that were written by Moorcock <laughs> oh that's so sick <laughs> yeah he was friends with them <laughs> he wrote some of their songs <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, I don't have anything else. Uh, I uh, went on a weekend getaway to meet up with some internet friends, some of whom I've met before and I talked about earlier this year. Uh, some of them I met for the first time in person, so that was really cool. Um, I don't have too much to say outside of, like, we just, you know, went to cool places to eat, drank a little bit at night walked around but we did go to a bowling alley slash arcade called lucky strike that is near the baseball field there and uh they had some you know most of it was like dumb like for kids arcade bullshit really you know fucking do the ski ball or shoot the basketball hoops to get tickets or whack-a-mole and all that shit but but they did have daytona championship usa which is a four-player multi you know multiplayer racing game and i took first place fuck you rory and jake uh, anyways, but, um, they had something there that was magical that I, I want to describe to you. So imagine okay. there's like an arcade machine I'm that's like a roller coaster cab, like a two seater roller coaster cab. Okay. And hanging from a little overhang in front of it are two, uh, like Oculus headsets. Ooh, Okay. And there's little air jets all around to simulate the experience of being on a roller coaster, I see. but in VR. Now, and here's the here's the kicker. What if I told you it was a rabbits themed roller coaster? Oh my <laughs> fucking god! <laughs> I went on Virtual Rabbids: The Big Ride. Uh, I have since learned, uh, tragically, that this is the first iteration of it. There's an Ultra HD one with six courses to go on instead of three. Uh, we went on a snowy mountain themed one, uh, that ends with you. Uh, first of all, I gotta say, it does actually feel shockingly like being on a roller coaster. Like, obviously they can't do much about the motion, but like the air and like the visual stimulus of just being in the headset shockingly does a good job of making you feel like you're going on a ride and feel a little out of it in a fun way. Um, and you, you go all throughout the snowy little fantastic mountain winding road you fall off a cliff a few times go over some sick jumps almost crash a bunch uh and then it ends with you getting sucked into a like like a whirlpool and then you end up in a toilet and then a rabbit smiles at you and picks you out with a plunger and then it cuts to black and ends and it's kind of weird how it ends like that that's, but that's a pretty weird ending yeah i was like i feel like this is a thing weirdos would pay for <laughs> uh, for nefarious reasons um <laughs> but uh it was fun i highly recommend if for some fucking reason you stumble onto a virtual rabbits of the big ride machine in your life to give it a shot um i'm gonna be real i don't think i'm gonna i don't see now i don't think i'm gonna stumble across that anytime soon 
Do you know, I didn't think, I didn't know it existed. Maybe ever it, in my life. <laughs> it was really weird. Uh, there's a lot, of, they had like a modern House of the Dead machine there that, I don't even remember the subtitle, but it was like a newer one I had never heard of. It was no. just like, oh, I didn't realize they were still making like new games of this. Uh, maybe, but yeah. maybe because Typing of the Dead was a huge hit. I don't know. True. You never know. You never know. Uh, that's all I had. Chicago, pretty fun city. Uh, changed a lot since COVID, actually. I had an Uber driver pick me up the first night after my we, we went back to my friend's hotel because uh, they were staying in like the central loop there. And, um, you know, I just got picked up out in front of it. And my Uber driver kept like, ta- like taking weird zigzags and stuff. He's like, yeah, man, I worked on this block like for eight fucking years. And there was there was never a hotel there before. Uh, just like so many places that were once office buildings have just turned into something else down there because you know COVID and shit. Everyone's working remote, so city feels a lot different. But uh, I had a good time. Nice. Uh, I think then that leaves only one big thing that we've both done. <laughs> That's right. Thunderbirds. No, <laughs> we. <laughs> We've we both finished Final Fantasy sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Uh Armored Core came out a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. Uh I've played it a bit. As have I. I streamed it once and I managed to get through the first chapter in about four hours, and then so I pe- had to so leave for my trip. People keep talking about chapters. Does it tell you when you enter in does it tell you chapter two? Yes. Okay, then I haven't finished chapter one. What was the last mission you did? Uh, I beat a rocket boss. You are at the end of chapter one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, we are at the same place. There we go then. Um, there is a yes. There's a, there's a there's a boss who's in the trailer for the game, um, who launches lots of missiles. Um, who's a bit of a dick, but I you know I I beat him. It took me like 20, 20, 25 minutes or something. God damn, um, that took that took me an hour. I was I was uh Okay, let's first things first. Fun stuff. Uh what you rocking? What's what you going with? <laughs> okay, so I so for context, I also feel like I should add I've played to completion six of the Armored Core games, the original PlayStation trilogy. Three, four, and four answer. In all of those games, I have typically done either just standard biped build, um, or I go for the quad legs. So this time, I was like, you know what? It's is a whole new shift in the series. Why don't I try out reverse joint this time? Uh, I think it'd be fun. So I'm doing a lightweight reverse joint build. Right now, I have a shotgun in one hand, and I believe just, like, a, a laser rifle in the other. Not, like, the pulse, like, bubbly rifle, but I think, like, like the more standard, yes. like, laser, like, pew-pew. Pew-pew. Uh, and you, then you also... You can hold it to charge and do, like, a big shot that uh, the enemy AC inevitably dodges. Um, then the... I don't even think I'm using that one. I can't remember what I have um, on my one hand. I know I have a shotgun on one. Mm-hmm. Um... But then the other, uh, both my shoulders, one has a four, a like four spread, like vertical rocket. And then the other one is like a dual, like go sideways, uh, dual rocket. So six rockets in total, if I go hog wild, um, and, uh, yeah, reverse joints. So I get to, uh, hop up real fast and, uh, that kick does extra damage when you have reverse joints equipped, apparently. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Damn. What you doing on Rubicon? Which also Should've makes hooped. sense. What was that? Uh, of what you doing on Rubicon? Should have hooped. <laughs> um, at the moment, uh, when I fought that boss, because I, I didn't, I didn't go back and switch my gear to fight the boss. I just, I just had the same, the same gear that I started the mission with. Uh, same. I, I, I unlocked the thing, the, the thing where you can just, you can, on your shoulders, you can just have other weapons on there. Um, and I was like, oh, this is, this is perfect uh, for right now. Cause what I want is I want uh, to go out there with the handgun is so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I'm going out with my, my mech. Uh, well, I've I've got like three setups, like with I've just I've I've split them out into three different color schemes, just so I've got the 
uh, and my, my one I beat the rocket with was Big Iron. <laughs> And I've got the the two handguns, and then I can switch them out for rocket launcher and a sword. Um, and I just you know staggered him, and then hit him with the hit him with the rocket, hit him with the the sword, and you know just do do, do damage. Um, I'm having a good time. I am too. I'm liking it a whole lot. I do have some thoughts. <laughs> Same. I only have one big one right now. What, actually, what's your big one? Um, so for all of the changes that they've made so far, I feel fine with them. It was, it, 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 it was really weird getting used to the fact the game controls like a normal video game, like just in terms of like, oh, smooth turning and stuff. Um, the one thing I think um, maybe- before, Before you say that, I'm putting something in spoiler and I'm putting it in the chat. Uh, this is my cold shot. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Should I click this or no? No, no, don't click it yet. Say what you're going to say. Okay. Uh, I don't like the repair kits. I wish that you just had a big pool of health. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's not. That's not what I had. But uh, that is. That is one of the things. Um, I. I put expenses in the spoiler. <laughs> um, uh, oh. I, it. I don't know if this is just. I don't know if this just got like much easier to not lose money in later armored core or something. I have only played like the first and second of the PS One armored cores. Um, shit cost money. In that in those games, uh, shit don't cost much money. Um, so like, it doesn't cost that much to fire all the bullets in your gun in this game. Um, it's a little weird. I will say, as the series, I I don't feel like any game really ever did the debt system right per se. Uh. Th- How I've started to think of the depth system in Armored Core in my head from the games I've played is that I I stopped caring about so much the expense thing other than like a soft ranking system in my head. Um, Especially any game with the arena, it just does not fucking matter Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, because you can grind the shit out of that. Uh, They actually wall you here, which I... If I recall, there are some games that kind of do it, but not as aggressively as this one does, where it's like, hey, we're going to give you, like, three people at a time sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, normally, I feel like it's more in, ba- like, bigger batches of, like, here's the first half, here's the second half sort of thing. Um, I've just kind of accepted that I feel like the debt and money stuff in Armored Core is mostly there for the flavor to, to a degree. <laughs> um, and then as, like, a... a also a soft ranking system to measure your own performance and then okay. also as a way to just have like a loose experience system for here's all of the new toys you get to play with after you've progressed beyond a certain point. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I ha- I have one, one, one other big thing, which is I just think the bosses are bullet sponges. Um, and I don't, I get that, you know, if they weren't, you would, you know, that would be very easy to deal with. Um, but it's just, it's kind of, I don't know. It feels weird to have such drawn out, um, fights that aren't, uh, you know, that aren't drawn out by, like, the difficulty of being able to hit someone. Um, it feels weird to, um, shoot something with, like, really high explosives, um, like and get like a direct hit when like they're staggered or something and for the machine that you have shot high explosives at to not really break (laughs) is like i don't know it's weird um like uh i there's um there's just there's something uh there's something about it that feels a little strange um the the one other thing about the bosses is um, I don't. The, Ace Combat Seven is a very good game, but it has like one glaring issue, which is that it has uh too many mid mission pivots. Um, which is like the, as far as I'm concerned, the social contract of Ace of Ace Combat is you get a briefing and it tells you what the mission's gonna be, and then you load out your plane and go do the mission that you were told you were gonna do. <laughs> um, there are like. Yeah, and then occasionally you can break that. Um, but uh, Ace Combat Seven just keeps fucking doing it, um, and it gets really annoying because, like, you know, you load up like a uh, you load up a fucking 
uh, whatever it is, the AC-10 or whatever, the Warhog, the, the thing where you, it's got the massive gun in the nose um, to go do a, like a mission to shoot things on the ground. And then suddenly you're having to dogfight people, um, like loads of, loads of enemies. And it's like, well, okay, I, I wouldn't have picked this. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I do, you know, uh, it, I don't know, you know, obviously they're not going to, it's not going to be all the time, so it's it's not going to be like a huge problem. But you know, the the there could be, I I guess like a a similar issue if you're not like prepared because like, uh, you you know, the setup, the idea of uh adjusting your build to fight like the boss, um, when they're like appearing halfway through the mission is really funny to me. <laughs> it's like it's it's really weird. <laughs> Um, it's a little strange. The thing that makes me kind of think that maybe I, like, I think I'm, I understand the, I think the happy medium that they got, which is, from what I can tell you, if you want to go for the S rank, I don't think you can do that. Wait, what does that mean? Oh, it, you can't be adjusting your build. I see. No, because I think to adjust your build, you have to die and reload a checkpoint or get to that screen. And I, I believe one of the requirements for us ranking a mission is you just need to do the whole thing in one go. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. I do actually one thing I do kind of like and I think is maybe a smart idea for games like this is, um, you know, I'm a sicko that in games with ranking things, I like to go for the high ranks just because I like to challenge myself and I, I get like a, a thrill out of improving in that way. I do think it's kind of neat how this game, they don't give you the letter ranking on your first go. It's when you go in for the replay that they're like, okay, here's your performance. Because then mm -hmm. it doesn't like make casual people feel bad when they're just like, I just want to progress the story and like not worry about that so much. Mm -hmm. But then people like me who are like, hey, hey fucking A rank, you need to get that S rank. Uh, I get to be a weirdo and do that for two hours. Mm -hmm. True, true. Um, it's nice that they also just open up the, the missions for replay immediately. Yes, that that I believe is a thing from fourth gen onward as well. So. Nice, nice. Um, uh, I do think it's very funny how everyone apparently decided I haven't done this yet, but apparently you get when you replay the missions, it gives you more credits. And apparently everyone decided that the mission where you beat up the test pilot is the one to do if you want to grind. <laughs> That's so funny. It's what, very funny. <laughs> poor sap. <laughs> that mission ruled. Like that was the first moment I feel like I had where I was like, "Oh, armored core writing is so fucking back." Because that whole mission briefing is, "Oh, if this fell into the hands of a skilled pilot, this thing is gonna ruin our day." And then you, and then you get there and it's some kills some guy, sixteen year old. <laughs> I just want to have a cool pilot name of my own. <laughs> Beat the shit out Fuck of him. this fucking oh, Mark Amara Ray before he can do anything. <laughs> yeah, it's so vicious. And then you get a mission later or whatever where uh, the guy's like, "Well, uh, the call sign we had saved for uh, someone is uh, open now for reasons, oh, so we're yes. just gonna give it to you." <laughs> oh, I hadn't made the connection that that's that's a yes, a yes, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the call sign. <laughs> that's so funny. Uh um, the, uh, the other thing is that, as usual, um, from software games, um, uh, I don't know what it is, I don't know who it is they hire, the, the one, the one exception is Sekiro, because it was done by Activision, um, but, uh, some, for some reason, they always manage to get just different like English localization. Like they, they don't just all have anime voice. Um they don't have dub voice. Um and uh the performances are so uh, so ridiculous the the guy the what is it, Balam or something guy who's like this super gung ho dude um calls you up with a new mission. Um and his name's amazing. Red <laughs> Oh his yes <laughs> You can oh, when, fight him in the arena. Yeah, when I when I when I found the guy called Red that I could fight in the arena, I was like, "Well, I have to kill you. There can't be two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to murder you immediately." Um, the uh, um, in keeping with last week's last week's theme, I guess I I, I had the subject on the brain because you know I, I had only edited the the episode fairly recently when the game came out. 
Um, I I made uh, a name myself November, gave myself a scorpion for the symbol. <laughs> for my symbol, I was like, yeah, this is who I am. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Perfect. Uh, we've we've uh, found out uh, since uh, since last week. Uh, Mel, a Pisces. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was incredibly <laughs> funny. <laughs> Which is the funniest possible result that could have possibly happened was me <laughs> posting about how that we got to in- well, I got to include me taking a swing at every Pisces list that we have, and Mel rocking up like, "Excuse me, <laughs> what did I do?" <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Um I am enjoying Armicle 6. I think it's good. I am too. I I I'm curious how I feel about the bosses as I go on. I feel like I just don't have enough info to work with yet. I enjoy them in a very action game like satisfying loop way, but like it feels so unlike anything else that's ever been in the series. Um so I'm curious how I feel about them after like a completed playthrough. Um, I, th- I, th- I think it's weird to fight enemies that you can't build. Like, like it's 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 weird to fight like a, uh, like an enemy mech that you couldn't theoretically make. And I realize there are enemy mechs you can't theoretically make in in other armored cores. I realize I realize that's true. Um, uh, even in like armored core one, all the all the like the the proper bosses are all like human plus, and like you have to yeah. you have to go human plus to make any of those any of those ACs. Um, but uh, there's something about them just not like that rocket that rocket boss is just not an AC. Um, that that I that I could make um is uh strange um. Oh, I have one other thing. I think the HUD could be like eight times more intrusive. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I realize, you know, Armored Core 4 is like very minimalist as well. And I realize that the style these days is like minimalist. But uh, I I can feel the information hiding from me uh, <laughs> when I'm looking at my enemies and I'm going, I, I better have the right weapon out. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to pull the trigger. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's all I have. Yeah, I I will probably stream more of it after uh, I get the YouTube version up of uh, our last Ultra Q episode, and then uh, after that, I'm probably going to stream more of it tonight <laughs> till I go to bed. Sick is a good game. Yeah, I'm. It's probably my favorite game I've played this year so far. I say as I need to get back to fucking Tears of the Kingdom and. Well, I guess go I gotta get back go to FF6 here at some point. <laughs> yeah, go. I'm not gonna... No, you don't. Um, you, I realize yeah. you do, but you don't. I, yeah. Uh, I still want to play Resident Evil 4, too. I need to play it. I need to go through... I started streaming 2 Remake and was having a good time, but I I just fell off of that. Mm. That is how it goes in life. Yeah. Um. I, I, did, I did not make it to Heavenswood. Before I I started Armored Core Six, it did not happen. So I I guess I'm free of MMO for a while. I'm happy for you. Yeah, I think you know I've kicked it. Um, I will be back anyway. Shall we talk about Ultra Seven? Yeah. Uh, let me tell you about Episode Nineteen, Project Blue. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> that to be fair, I you feel could, like that's a feel, weird one. I didn't raise my tone at the end, but you could feel you could hear the question anyway. <laughs> yes. I to be fair, I feel like that's a weird that would be a weird one to have multiple versions of. You never know. You know they could they could do anything. Mm-hmm. Dimension X versus SpaceX. Um Yeah. Dr. Miyave is working on Project Blue, a plan to develop a defense barrier around the Earth to protect from alien threats. Uh, late one night after returning home to be with his wife, uh, the doctor sees a monster in his room. Um, and the next day, he discovers an underground... Uh, wait, what the... No, this is... This is literally the thing... No, delete this. <laughs> Let me read mine. The one I put effort into and wrote. 
with my with my own two <laughs> God hands. Damn. God damn. All right. Project Blue is a scientific effort to protect the Earth from further alien invasions using electromagnetic barriers surrounding the planet, complete with secret entrances so humanity may still explore the stars. Uh, that does a much better job. Thank you, Wiki. Uh, the man in charge of Project Blue is Dr. Miyabe, and he's returned home for some much-needed time off so he can spend some time with his wife. Uh, he gives her a dress as a present and says he plans to spend all day tomorrow doing jack shit. King. Uh, True. But his day is ruined. His peaceful day is disturbed when he finds a secret passage in the floor of the kitchen, which he investigates. Uh, down I also do want to pause before we get too far away from it. I do think it's very funny that this husband and wife sleep in two separate beds in the same room. Uh, this is so I believe this is a completely normal arrangement in Japan. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I've seen this a lot. Um, okay. And uh, to be honest, to be honest, uh, it sucks sleeping in a, sleeping in a bed with someone. Don't like it. Uh, so, uh, ideal arrangement. <laughs> IMO. I see. I just, you know, I'm tall. I sprawl. Anyway. I respect it. Um. Listen, more choices? Always welcome. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh, where was I? Yes, his peaceful day, yes, finds a secret passage in the floor of the kitchen which he investigates down a metallic spiral staircase he finds himself in a spaceship under his house and gets captured by the alien bardo um with dr miyabe secured bardo intends to get him to give up the location of the project blue plans with these plans bardo will be able to lead an invasion force down to earth um Miyabe's wife returns home and finds her husband missing and the phone line cut bardo begins like remotely menacing her um, and is showing Miyabe a live feed of it, saying, ooh, something's bad gonna happen to your wife if you don't give up the plans. Um, and Miyabe's like, I will never give up the plans. Um, elsewhere in the plot, the Ultra Guard have been worrying about whether it would be rude to show up at Miyabe's house and ask if he's okay, because it's his day off. Um, Dan and Anne head out to check in on him and hear his wife screaming. They break in uh, and they, they kind of lose track of the thread here point is there's something to do with a mirror um <laughs> and <laughs> getting through going through the mirror uh takes you into the spaceship or something um uh they you know bardo has an atomic bomb set up for if his plan fails uh and dan turns into ultra, ultra 7 to save the day miyabe and his wife are saved and ultra 7 destroys the fleeing bad spaceship bardo not bad <laughs> the fleeing bad spaceship <laughs> i mean <laughs> that is how it is. Yeah. is yeah uh, dr miyabe then reveals the plans were hidden in plain sight and shines a special light on his wife's dress revealing the plans are sewn into it uh the end uh, not normal not not everything about <laughs> everything about the final reveal feels like you have you ever spent time with a couple and realized that they are getting off on something And you don't yes. know what you don't know what it is, but they are cl they are clearly getting off on something, and they think you don't realize. <laughs> yeah. Um. This 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 is the vibe. <laughs> I didn't think about it that way, but now that you mention it, it's totally that. It was it was everything about Miyabe's wife getting menaced in the house, uh, while him while he's tied to like a table. It did feel a little skeevy. Okay, I'm happy it wasn't. <laughs> no, you are not alone. I okay. <laughs> because it's so elongated. The, so much of the episode is just her getting like hassled around the house. Some of the aliens like, hey, hey, hey I'm gonna drop the chandelier on your wife, and he's like, no, evade the chandelier, wife. <laughs> Um, it's, a uh, it, the, the, <laughs> some very weird vibes on this, on this episode. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, going into this, what I had planned to say was, I feel like this is the episode of Ultra 7 I have had just, like, the least to say so far, because it was just, it was like a tone piece, but there was no tone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's weird. Um... I've got some notes here from Mel. Uh, 
um, for the just b- before before we wind up saying everything that Mel has to say, just in case that happens. Um, yeah. Uh, open here. Uh, Mel's episode nineteen notes. What even is this professor's lighter? Do you remember his lighter? I don't remember his lighter. No. Uh, let- it's been about a week since I've watched. Oh, but- <laughs> it's one. It's like a. There are like those big, those big lighters, those lighters that are big. Um, it might be one of those. Uh, anyway, kind of fucked up, kind of fucked that the Plutonian civilization got nuked and then demoted from a planet. Um, oh, oh yeah, there is, is that. Yeah, Bardo goes on like a spiel about how, um, uh, life, the only life in this solar system used to be on Pluto or something. Um, uh, but yeah. Then he destroyed it all. Destroyed it all. Uh, Jun is in this episode again. Mm Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Um, Mel says, I don't think the lip syncing is working for Grace's performance, and some of these expressions are choices. <laughs> we've got, we've got now, the, the, uh, you know, the Ultra, the Ultra series made by Tsuburaya is trying to create a Western vibe. There are a lot of white people in these shows. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, uh, this this man has his his white wife and she is dubbed um, uh, by someone else maybe. Um, uh, Mel's notes here say confession waves. I assume that's a torture technique that Bado used on. <laughs> yeah, uh, on Miyabe. Um, I remember those. <laughs> Uh, I like how the self-proclaimed emperor of space is doing home alone shenanigans, but also impressive. They put an entire secret base under this guy's house overnight. Um, truly very strange shenanigans going on. <laughs> With the fucking... This was a fucking weird one. <laughs> like, and not in like an interesting weird way, even just like. It was it just this one felt off. In a, mm-hmm. in a strange way. <laughs> mm-hmm. So my so my summary kind of loses track of the plot there between the mirror and like there's an alien that gets shot at some point in this episode, um, but uh, there's basically like the the memorable bit the memorable bit of the episode is the weird stuff between the husband and the wife, uh, and then Dan and Anne come in and there's a there's just some some stuff happens um this is really like they're having the shootout with the like invisible like yes yeah um, yes uh ultra seven entering the mirror world is sick also insert ryuki opening here uh yes classic um it is funny dan just transforms around the corner from where Anne is um dan does not give a fuck compared compared to uh hayata and the effort that he went to to try to get out of other people's line of sight, um, Hayata would go running off in a direction for like three hours, um, and <laughs> then hit the button. Meanwhile, Dan is just like, "I'm just gonna nip around the corner here, pop the glasses on, and come back around. Just go. Don't don't go around there. Dan's over there. Just don't go around there. He's still there, probably. Uh, I'm Ultra Seven. Bye bye. <laughs> I'm different from Dan." <laughs> Uh, the uh, th- did this alien have brass knuckles? Yeah, he had like a weird like combat brass knuckles thing that that he had on. Holy shit, that was a thing. That's cool. That's cool. Anne is the only person who ever notices that Dan fucks off. Anne's paying attention. Yeah, and I do. If I recall, he has a, like a, a throwaway line at the end of the episode too. That was something along the lines of, "Oh, uh, one ran off towards the mountain, so I chased after it, and now I'm back." <laughs> <laughs> it is really funny. Um, Mel says she doesn't know how she feels about the Earth Barrier Plan, but otherwise thinks this episode is cool as an actual alien home invasion episode that we saw hints of with uh, uh, Curaso. Um, Yes, I like. I do think I like skeeviness and all. I like the weird husband wife, the weird uh, menacing shit going on. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, it's obviously it's a little it's a little weird, but I think it's the 
uh, the right kind of weird for to make stupid TV out of it. I, I feel like I genuinely struggle to come on to like a, any critical opinion of this episode, of everything we've ever watched. I'm just like, mm-hmm. I don't know how to feel about this. It's just so like, I don't know if I want to say hollow because hollow sounds bad, but it's just like, it's not, it's not bad. Like, I do think like the creepiness of some of the like, the terror this alien commits on on this couple is like effective um but the, like there's just it's just like nothing really had an impact on me for this episode i don't know i do kind of like the idea of oh uh you know all that life on pluto no yeah it's because i fucking like <laughs> i dealt with that problem um i think that's that's kind of interesting as a villain but also at the same time it, it's really weird to me how this guy is such a major threat with this, like, planet-annihilating bomb, and it's just underneath this couple's house, and and in in practice, he's just, like, he turns invisible and has a little pew-pew gun. Like, it's, it's such a weird dichotomy. Um, yeah, I think I am completely neutral on this episode overall. <laughs> mm-hmm. Would you, would you like, uh, would you like uh, some fun trivia, at least? Yes. Uh, Miyabe's actor played Koji in episode 22 of Ultra Q. Now, do you remember who Koji is and what episode 22 of Ultra Q is? Koji's the big giant caveman, right? He's the giant man. Yes, that's what I thought. Oh, I guess he wasn't a caveman. He just had a beard. <laughs> but... <laughs> he, was, he, was, he just had, he just had uh, a cloth for modesty. Um, mm-hmm. This is good, the fucking Morpho Butterflies guy. Uh, if they weren't cowards, they wouldn't have shot that with modesty in mind. Um, but, you know. It is what it is. It was television. <laughs> yeah, you can get away uh, with all kinds of shit like that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was directed and written by Samaji uh, Nonagase. Samaji Nonagase, sorry, I, pro- I pronounced that weird. Um, who, you may remember, uh, this is a long-time Ultra contributor, uh, did Pegula, both one and two, Hell Belunga, yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, Garrett, Garamond Strikes Back. Hell yeah. Ragon. Uh, Fury of the South Sea. This is Idol the, this of Goga. Is, this is this is <laughs> this is the guy, this is the original guy where you said you gave you were listing off a thing and I said out loud, this is our guy, and then you said Fury yes. of the South Sea. <laughs> I was yeah. owned. And also responsible for uh the Ragon episode of Ultraman. Uh oh that's five the seconds. One. The rag- Five seconds b- before the explosion, which I don't remember which one that is off the top of my head. That's the Ragon. Oh, shit, you're right. Oh, what's the Coast Guard command, then? Uh, what is Coast Guard Oh, that's command? the fake Peter, right? Oh, it's fake Peter. Uh, and then Bluestone of Barati. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. He missed a lot in Ultraman. He did lightning operation, which I think was the poison gas monster one. No, that was the uranium monster one. Okay, that was all. Right. Uh, yeah, brother from another planet, all time oh, classic. Hang on, we're back. <laughs> yeah, uh, demons rise again. Oh, it's over. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, you know what? I actually have a note. I feel like between. Oh no! Actually, I think no. Never mind. I I was about to say I feel like I have, I an observation about this guy's style, but I think that's actually an observation for episode twenty one. So never mind. Um, human specimens five and six. Oh, that which was, one was that one was kind of fun. That was the that was the one where it started with. Oh, it's the Dada uh, one. It's, it's the guy on the it's there. He's on the the captain's on the bus with the woman yes, who's yes, definitely yes, yes. evil, and then she's normal. And there's a completely you know, unrelated plot. That feels like this episode a little bit in terms of just like the what, what the fuck like because that's the one where there's the little people in the capsules and shit. And it's like what, why? <laughs> why did you make them little? Yeah. Um. And then uh, the challenge into Subterra, which is the uh, Goldon episode. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, uh, and then from this, from Ultra 7, did episode 2 and 3, which we both liked a lot. That's good. I guess, I guess Ultraman brings out the mid in all of us. True. Um, 
It's an unfortunate uh, thing to say on this on, on the Ultraman podcast. <laughs> you know, well, there's a lot more Ultra this, Ultraman yeah. on the horizon. Ultraman. Ultraman. Yep. Um, uh, and then episode 20 was also uh, Nonagase. Oh, ah, okay. That's directed nice. only. We'll talk about the writer after. Ooh. Cool. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, I don't have loads more to say. We, you know, there's some you know, weird vibes. It is what it is. Uh, and um, I, I, I think... I think the I think the aliens could be cooler sometimes. Yeah, uh, I think the, we, we've hit a this stretch. This guy was pretty forgettable. Yeah, we've hit a stretch of some forgettable aliens. I couldn't I couldn't tell you what the deal with this alien is really. Um, I had literally forgotten about the Pluto stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, uh, it's you know, it's all right. It's not the, it's not the best episode in the world, but you know, we we've had worse. Yeah. Uh, Shall we move on to episode 20? Yes. Dis- now, this one, many opportunities for fucking up. I, <laughs> I definitely think that this title is wrong. Destroy Earthquake Epicenter X. Ding, ding, ding. 100% accurate to this book. Oh, shit. Let's go. Yeah. All My right. jaw kind of dropped a little bit when you got to the X, not going to lie. Yeah. God damn. All right. Strange, unexplainable earthquakes are plaguing Japan. I misspelled plaguing. Oh, well. The Ultra Guard try to enlist the help of Dr. Iwamura to investigate the most recent earthquake, but he's too grumpy. Um, (laughs) His assistant is very friendly, though. Um, uh, When the guard uh, heads to the location of the earthquakes to investigate themselves, uh, they find a couple of women who are supposed to be doing a rally, uh, but they took a wrong turn and started hearing monster roars. Um, I have. I assume this is an amateur event that they're going to. <laughs> um, uh, they also found a strange rock. Um, the guards see a house nearby and take the two women there. Uh, when they knock, Dr. Iwamura answers the door. Uh, he is already here to investigate the earthquakes, but he is shocked by the rock that the rally drivers have. It's Ultonium. Um... Yeah. I'm always looking for Altonium in and these hills. It's, it's an element found only at the Earth's core. If something is mining Altonium from the Earth's core, then that could explain the earthquakes. And it could spell disaster for the Earth. The Ultra Guard deploy the Magma Riser. Uh, Dan, Furuhashi, and Amagi take it toward uh, the Earth's core. Uh, but on the way, they get attacked and trapped underground as they fall unconscious at the controls. Uh, every goddamn time <laughs> every goddamn time every i am so sick of these motherfuckers and any of these shows going underground and then struggling for two minutes because they're running out of box <laughs> to be fair this time it's not as long as it has been but they go to this well a lot <laughs> they do um dr. bring I- oxygen tanks <laughs> Uh, Dr. Iwamura learns of this disaster and looks out the window in sorrow. His assistant points to Iwamura's shadow and Anne sees the shadow is in the shape of an alien. Um, that's cool. That's a cool shot. Um, it's really good. Anne and the assistant flee together, uh, but Iwamura pursues and it is revealed somehow. Do you remember how, how the assistant is revealed to be the alien? Yes. So... Uh, while they're running out, so he, uh, he, the assistant points out to Anne, like, hey, look at the shadow, and then he's very quietly like, let's leave, uh, and then runs off with her th- in the woods, and as he's running out with her, he drops a weird, suspicious-looking, like, device or, like, metallic thing out of his pockets, um, and, uh, the rally drivers find it, and then bring it back to the professor, and then he goes... There's no reason why he should have this, like, kind of menacingly, because, you know, we, the audience, still think he is the alien threat. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it cuts to the professor cornering Anne and the assistant, like, on a cliff face, um, where it's then revealed by the the, uh, professor that uh, that device that the assistant dropped is not 
an earthly material, and the only reason that he would have access to it was if he was in fact an alien. Dramatic shock. Yes. Um, and then the assistant reveals himself to be the third member of Daft Punk. <laughs> Uh, yep. Yep. Um, Listen, I like the design actually a lot on this guy. Um, but what about the shadow? Um, simple hypnosis, says the alien assistant. Look at your shadow now, Anne. And turns Anne's shadow into the shadow of an alien. Oh, while he's fucking about doing that, Sogan and shoot him, and he dies. Uh, that, that is so. It is so funny how little this guy manages to achieve before he just gets dual shot. Uh, I also like how, uh, if I if I recall, like someone says something like, "Oh, aim for the eyes," and I don't think either of them hit him in the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Expert marksman devices shoot shoot him in the eyes and then misses. Uh, maybe uh, one of them does. I can't remember, but I remember thinking like I don't think either of them hit hit his eyes. <laughs> Mate, well, he's an alien. They don't. They, what Soga said out loud: shoot him in the eyes. And Anne, being a qualified member of the Ultra Guard, thought, "Well, it's an alien. I don't know where his eyes are." <laughs> That's fair. Um, so, uh, they shot him, uh, normally. And he dies. Um, problem solved. Meanwhile. Uh, this alien's name was Chaplay, by the way. <laughs> Goodbye, Chaplay. Uh, or is it Chaplay? It's probably Chaplay, because it's probably, like, Shadow? Oh, Shadow Play. Yeah. Oh. Uh, clocked in on, on how the... You know the the Japanese shortening of things. We got it. We got it dialed in. Mm -hmm. This is where we're completely wrong. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Dan has woken up and turned into Ultra Seven, and he fights the kaiju that was underground. He defeats it and rescues the magma riser. All's well that ends well. And the captain says, "Ah, maybe Furuhashi, you uh, would like to be the irritable Iwamura's new assistant." Everyone has a good look, good laugh, except presumably uh, Doctor Iwamura, who's probably like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> uh, the end. Uh, that's uh, the episode. I have to say, I think this is the first time that I think. On paper, I like the kaiju's design more than I like how it was executed as a suit. Oh, um, damn. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but I felt like when it was when it was wrestling with Ultra 7, like, there were just a lot of parts of the suits where it was, like, caving in, and you could see it was, like, very clearly, yeah. like, suit material and, like, flopping around. And, like, it, it looked like it needed more, like, material filling it so mm -hmm. that it, it looked a little bulkier because it kept, like, like, like just, there are so many, like, indents where you could just see like the rubbery material giving way to like w meet wherever the actor inside was mm -hmm. uh, like the suit just looked too big for the guy inside i have been thinking about this recently is the the weird kind of disconnect between me and the audience that these shows were intended for is that when the effects are goofy and very obviously not real i'm kind I, I like it i'm like oh that's funny that's that's fun i like that um, be mm -hmm. like, cause I'm, and like, I'm looking for where all the effects aren't like we mentioned episode, uh, well, there was an episode of, is it ultra seven or yes, it's ultra seven. Cause it's got a Maggie in it. Um, there was an episode where two of the ultra guard got cloned. Um, yes. and there's just a very simple, uh, trick of just like filming two guys from the back. Uh, walk towards um, the actors for Amagi and Soga, um, and uh, and I'm just like, oh, that's cool. Uh, whereas you know, the intention of the effect is that no one will think about it at all. Uh, the intention yeah. behind it is that the audiences go, don't think anything, um, and that kind of dis. I've been thinking about that disconnect because, like, you know, I see like the suit is like more obviously not a monster than usual. And I think to some degree, my brain goes, Oh, that's fun. Um, and, uh, I, this is all, <laughs> this also came, I was thinking about this recently because of next episode is all based in water. And 
Uh, one of my favorite. I was I was tweeting about this. Is one of my favorite things is when uh, <laughs> is when you can see that water is too big. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the droplets of water are huge, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I I love models. Um, but uh, but yes, the. the uh, the, the suit is not quality wise it's not it's not used the best in the world <laughs> um other than that though i actually feel like i liked this episode quite a bit i actually i genuinely thought the reveal that the assistant was the was the villain be like masterminding all this and not the professor was actually really effective and like i i enjoyed how they did so much work making this professor seem weird and just so like unsociable as to be maybe up to something nefarious and then actually it's like no he's just he's just kind of a dick but he he's he is just an honest to god like scientist mm -hmm. man trying to do the best thing he just gets really caught up in his work that he's passionate about uh i like this one a lot yeah it's pretty good um i got some notes here uh, from Mel. Um, she has noticed uh, that Soga gets paired up with Dan a lot, uh, but they go well together. Um, even if uh, she does prefer to see Anne in action, uh, they seem like the young guys slash rookies of the team. Um, uh, we 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 we've been talking about how uh, Ultra Guard has kind of got guys at this point. The uh, like, so Soga's got his things. Um, it's not like. Uh, it's like deep characterization or anything, but you know, so Soga's Soga. I know who Soga is. Yeah. Um, Ultonium is some more fake science shit. Uh, the Earth's core is made of iron and nickel. Uh, the spirit of Ichi no Tani is alive and well. Um, uh, thank you, Mel, uh, for telling us that Ultonium isn't real. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I, it's, it's very here's right. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. People always talk about unobtainium from Avatar. That's like the least egregious bit of that movie. It's it's <laughs> funny. It's funny that they called the rock unobtainium. That's good. It, if it's funny, it's good. That's how you know. Lighten up. Um, Alt Altonium, good good fake name for a rock in Ultraman. I agree. It's um, a good one. Why are we leaving? Why are we leaving? And behind. How? Um, wait, hold on. Do you want to put money down on the fact that they? I bet you something decades from after this was written brings Altonium back as like some weird dumb lore explanation for like how something works or what something is made out of. I love. Zeta I guarantee Gundam. it. Yeah. Gundanium, fucking bullshit. Um, yes, absolutely. Altonium will be back. I bet. Um. Uh. Does the magma riser just have explosive gas or something? Um, is Mel's question. <laughs> well, yeah, because there is there is that part where it sprays like it sprays what I thought was like they like got a, they got some weird gadgets. They got some weird gadgets on this mall. Yeah. Um, all you all you Cause, need because the they mall, cause an explosion to create a tunnel so that they can dig deeper down. <laughs> all you need on the mall is a big drill. And some fucking sh like explosive shots out the front, um, and you need a rocket on the back. Um, that's all you need. Uh, I would argue they also need uh, backup oxygen. Uh, they also need backup oxygen. Well, I guess actually the reason why they, I think the problem was more so the heat this time though too, right? Uh, because it got too fucking hot because they're by the magma. Uh, you know what they also got to do with these fuck now. I got now. I like the Magma Riser. But. But. This thing is not drilling a hole wide enough for itself to go through. <laughs> that is true. Look at this thing. Look at it. Uh. No, drills just need to drill good enough and, you know, don't worry about squeezing the rest through that is, I that love, is larger I than love the actual its, drill head. I love its exhaust pipes. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, compare this uh, with the, the mole. 
I'll send you an image of the mole now. Now, what you need to understand about the mole is that the yellow bit um, with the drill on the end comes off the base when it goes drilling. Oh. And it's got... It's yeah, got, this looks it's feasible. It's got a rocket on, on the back. And it's got those treads on the side for backing up when it needs to back up. Mole's good. Um, anyway, that's enough, uh, that's enough Ultra 7 uh, design slander. Um, I do like the Magma Riser. Um, Malza, uh, because I did that, I lost Mel's notes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's coming back to find me here we go um uh alien chaplet isn't that the girl from high school musical um i i, I don't think i've ever seen high school high, high school musical unfortunately i have not either um sorry mal <laughs> Uh, Girado Giradoga sounds like a double Zeta era Neo Zeon mobile armor name. It fucking does. <laughs> it it is. Giradogas exist. That's the. Those are the. Uh, those are the Zaku's in Shars Counterattack. Oh, with yes. The sorry. Weird helmets. Um, sorry. The uh, the what's what's happening here is uh, Mel is pointing out that uh, the Kaiju is called Giradorus and is hearing it as Giradoga. <laughs> uh, it's just like. Just, it just, just sounds mobile suity. Um, yes, the kaiju is a bit goofy looking. Uh, it is also absolutely two guys in that suit. Um, oh, I don't even think I picked up on that part of it. I that does make sense, though. Uh, it does make sense. Um, this is a long boy. This is a long boy. Oh yes, I had completely forgot when, when he cuts the head off, and what happens when he cuts the head off is rocks start to fall out and i was like damn bro <laughs> you that's all that blood is coming out of you <laughs> I, I so i rewound because i had this exact same experience i think there is blood at the start too i think it's both okay because i at first i was like wait is it just rocks and then i looked back but it looks it looks like wet maybe it's just how reflective the rocks are um, yeah. it's, it, even even in the HD of the Blu-ray, like it's it's kind of hard to tell, but I think it's both blood and the rocks. But then when you cut to it on the ground, it's mostly just the rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, something I do want to note is that I do believe uh, I think that some of the more harder like dissections and beheadings we have seen uh, from the series have been because of uh, Mister Samaji Nonagase. Um, I see. Because episodes two and three also had some pretty hardcore deaths, if I recall, and those also were directed by him. Likes a beheading. Noted. He, he loves it. He loves the blood geysers. And honestly, they do look cool. <laughs> Same. Same, bro. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Mel's uh, uh, last couple of notes. Uh, the magma and snow effects were cool this episode, but the rainbow was not... This is so funny. <laughs> the <laughs> the rainbow just drawn on at the end is very very funny. Um, final note, not as good as last week's Magma Rise episode. Uh, weird we got one so soon. Uh, but this was still a neat episode. Uh, I uh I don't know that I could call it between uh these the those two episodes. The last last week's being uh the one where Dan meets Dan. Yeah. I think I liked this one more just because that Robot City thing was a little weird. Uh, come to Robot City if you want an ass kicking. <laughs> um, this was also then written by Bunzo Wakatsuki, who uh, you may remember uh, from uh, Ultraman writing the Gamora two-parter and then the uh, episode about the weird comet that everyone gets freaked out about. Uh, but then from Ultra 7, wrote episode 6, The Dark Zone, fuck yeah, um, with our great friend Pegasa. Uh, and oh, then yeah. also wrote, uh, maybe a little less fuck yeah, uh, episode 10, The Suspicious Neighbor, uh, which encourages <laughs> the youth of Japan to rat on their fucking neighbors if they see anything suspicious. If you think you're living next to a commie, <laughs> you, was so you weird. fucking let us know. <laughs> Uh, um, tell your parents. Um, I will say though, out of out of all of his uh, material for Ultra Seven, I I feel like I I'm liking his episodes overall as they're written. 
they're fun. Even like even with that weird stuff in the suspicious neighbor one, it was memorable for how like out there that one got. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes the guy's just pondering his orb, and it's it's a weird time. Yeah. Um. I don't have much more to say about this episode. Uh, uh I think this is my favorite of the week. I like this ooh, one quite a bit. My my favorite is the third one. Um, but uh, that's just because I think it's cool. I I you know I'm looking at Mel's notes uh, for the next episode, and it turns out me and Toru Narita have a disagreement about how cool <laughs> put strapping the Yamato onto a kaiju is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I will say the third episode did feel very redcore. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, anyway, episode 21 of Ultra 7 um, is called... Oh, I don't have the fucking title here. What's the title? This is, I've been very messy on my notes <laughs> this, <laughs> this week. Um, what is the title of this episode? Uh, Ultra 7, 21. Um. Um. No, apparently that's a guy. <laughs> wait. Uh, Ultra Seven, Episode Twenty One. Uh, pursue this. No, that's not true. Uh, pursue the undersea base. Yes, that is true. There we go. Not the title <laughs> that's on YouTube that just says pursue the sea bottom base. Um, See, that's a fucking Mario sixty four. Lo- like, not even. That sounds like a star though, in in like Jolly Roger Bay. Yeah, or Dire Dire Docks. Um. All right. So, in the middle of the night, a ship gets attacked and destroyed by a kaiju that looks like it might have a battleship for a head. That can't be right. It's probably just got a hammerhead shark type thing going on. Um. Well. When the Ultra Guard investigate, it turns out there are witnesses who claim that the attacker looked a lot like the battleship Yamato. Uh, Furuhashi and Damagi are launched in the UG submarines to see if the Yamato wreck is still where it used to be. They find two things. One, no it's not. (laughs) Uh, And two, a starfish-shaped UFO is down there with them and it traps them, knocking Amagi and Furuhashi unconscious. Here's the deal. The aliens are gathering wreckage from the bottom of the sea to use as weapons against the Earth and have created the super weapon Iron Rocks using the wreckage of the Yamato. What a fucking good name. It's so <laughs> sick. Uh, iron, like the top of Iron Rocks, which is just like the tower of the battleship and an array of cannons, rises out of the sea um, and fires upon a seaside town. Um Dan attacks it in an Ultra Hawk, but is shot down and he crashes into the sea, sinking to the floor. Kiriyama deploys in another Ultra Hawk, and together with Anne and Soga in the pointer, they knock out Iron Rocks, rendering it immobile. Uh, Kiriyama returns to base and has some dramatically lit conversations with the TDF guy played by Jun's actor, um, as Kiriyama confronts the fact that three members of his team are MIA and it is learned that Iron Rocks has a self-destruct mechanism that will trigger in 15 minutes, um, uh, trigger 15 minutes after it's rendered immobile. Uh, They don't have the equipment to drag Iron Rocks back out to sea. There's nothing they can do. Um, Iron Rocks grows restless, awakens once more to fire upon the town. This wakes up Dan, still hanging out in the Ultra Hawk under the sea. He turns into Ultra 7 and fights Iron Rocks, which now rises fully out of the sea to stand on two legs, ready for a proper guys in suits kaiju fight. Um, as the clock counts down to self-destruct, Ultra 7 manages to escape Iron Rocks special handcuff attack. I don't know why it has a handcuff attack uh, and destroys the kaiju. Uh, the starfish UFO is forced to flee and without its rays to keep Amagi and Furuhashi asleep, they surface in their subs and shoot the one, the UFO, and two, the poor cameraman. <laughs> all, <laughs> uh, all is well. Uh, the end. Okay, so this was the thing I was going to say, because uh, remember that episode with the two f- of Ultraman, of the two kaiju just, like, fighting in the arena, and then it just fucking ends? Mm-hmm. That that the this episode's ending reminded me a lot of that, and I thought at first that this was also another Nonagase episode, and then I was like, wait, no, this is this was actually a uh, 
This was a uh, Toshitsugu Suzuki episode, uh, which also leads me to something that I need to correct uh, from last time. There's been a misunderstanding. Oh, no. So, <laughs> 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 so uh, last time when doing the show notes, we talked about how, oh yeah, it makes sense that episode 16, The Eye That Shines in the Darkness, is a lot like the Mephilus episode because it's directed and written by the same guy, uh, Toshitsugu Suzuki and uh, Keisuke Fujikawa. Uh, it turns out, same director, but I got a little excited. Uh, the writer was uh, Tetsuo Kinjo for the um, for the Mephilus episode, not Fujikawa. Sorry about that. Forgive us, ruffians. <laughs> 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 Anyways, bow bow back to talking about the episode. I thought this one was pretty solid. Yeah, it's 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 there's not like um plot wise there's not like loads happening um but uh there is just there is just enough cool shit to activate my brain um which is that now go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, I think I cut you off. What were you gonna say? <laughs> uh, no, I was gonna I I had cut. I was going to do my thing that I do where I continue talking without knowing uh, what I'm about to say. Um, and then just this, this stuff happens. Oh, it's okay. I do that all the time on this show too. Um, that's just podcasting. Uh, no, but I, I feel like I couldn't turn my brain off for the first half of this episode because I'm like, I know like the Yamato is like a symbol of like, imp like the final vestiges of power of Imperial Japan and like, them at their height of like engineering strength and and its loss representing like the the fall of the empire and like the coming of a a, a different era for Japan sort of thing, um and I know that that's kind of a shadow over everything that kind of features it in media, uh but like the more I thought about it the more I was kind of like, I think they just went with it because it is like a big like threat in terms of just having a bunch of massive firepower. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, makes for, like, a very easy, like, shorthand for, like, oh, no, like, naval power and bombardment sort of thing. So, um, the Yamato is... So, I I learned this fairly recently. The Yamato is interesting in the sense that um, it sank um, and it didn't accomplish anything. Um, and so, it's quite a popular image for, like, Japanese leftists as well. Um... Oh, because okay. it was like it was a huge fuck off battleship, incredible investment, real like navy guys stroking a massive hard on, thinking about the power of this vessel, and then it does nothing. Um, so there's a de there's a degree to which like space, you know, I'm not saying you know space battleship Yamato has a lot going on that I think you know I don't think it's you know I I think sucks. Uh, but I the, still need to get to it. The I, use I gotta do the that. use of the Yamato itself could be read as quite tongue in cheek. It would be it would be similar to the like. Imagine if imagine if we made a show about how we needed to make a, like a, an apocalyptic scenario, and we had to make a delivery across space, and we did that by strapping warp engines to the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I I I, I see. Um, so you know, th I, that's interesting. I never yeah, knew that. I when when I ran into this, I was like, "That's a dynamic I had not considered," but um, is it is interesting. But the the frankly, I never knew it didn't accomplish anything. Like I I've always known of its reputation as oh, it was like an achievement of like military design at the time, and it was like kind of fucking terrifying how strong it was, sort of thing. But like I I knew it sank. I didn't realize that like it kind of failed in terms of like military success <laughs> mm -hmm. it's so it was commissioned a week after the attack on pearl harbor um served as the flagship um uh of the combined fleet in june 1942 admiral uh, uh isoroku yamamoto directed the fleet from her bridge during the battle of midway a disastrous defeat for japan um, Yamato spent the rest of the year moving between major Japanese naval bases in response to American threats. Uh, Yamato was torpedoed in 1943, uh, uh, needed to be repaired. Um, uh, although present at the Battle of the Philippine Sea in 1944, played no part in the battle, uh, the only time Yamato fired her main guns at enemy surface targets was in 1944. Um, 
and uh, then uh, duh, 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 and then it was sent on like it's you know it's uh, where where is this where is this show me the get get me to the sink uh, get me to the sinking operation uh, point is it was sent somewhere as like a last dish effort to do it was like a hail mary mission uh to um uh to like intercept something it was like hail mary naval mission and it just failed and sank so yamato kind of didn't do shit in the war um which is like the, that's the that's the source of it's like you can you can use it in a needling way okay um I you know I don't know necessarily that the people making space battleship Yamato were I think I think maybe they're str- maybe they're straddling both lines of that, <laughs> or maybe as with many things that run long, maybe it depends on the iteration we are talking about too. I could see that this being is the case there as well. This is true. Um, I bet uh, that um... anyway. J- j- point is there's a lot in like the stuff in ideon that's like very clearly like tomino is mad about space battleship yamato um and uh yeah there's a lot in that show that is like you know i think kind of sucks uh but like there's there's some if it swung harder I think it would be a more worthwhile show, but you know, I, I can't really go into that because that's that's spoiler territory. Um, but uh, yes, you can use the Yamato in kind of a tongue-in-cheek way, and I don't, you know, I, there's something to be said for like depicting the Yamato as like rising out of the ocean and being a menace to Japan, as you know, I, I, which is a plot point I would not be surprised to see in say like uh, the kind of episode. Uh, that we get from the like open lefties that are working in the ultra series, uh, yeah. Like um, what's his face that I've already forgotten his name? Jasoji. That's the one. <laughs> How? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I literally. I was just like, hang on. The name. Name. <laughs> name. Can't do it. Uh... Um. But yeah, like it's a. Uh... But that's I did I, I didn't really get the vibe this time. For, I don't per I, se. I'm I'm not here for whether this episode is uh agree, agrees with me or not. I'm here for the fact that the wreckage of the battleship Yamato ascends out of the <laughs> sea and starts sinking ships. It's cool as hell. <laughs> it does look cool. the 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 miniature work here is very good. Also, I do like the 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 shape of like the starfish style like Mm -hmm. like design it's very cool with like the the black and white thing going on with it too Mm -hmm. uh it's pretty good yeah it's um the uh there's the the moment kiriyama comes back to base and starts talking to jun and everything just starts getting like (laughs) like everyone is putting in three times as much effort as before (laughs) is really it's like it's like very stark it's like oh damn okay (laughs) i guess we're going for something here is like as suddenly uh lighting team uh going out of their way um and uh, got these this dramatic shot of like not jun and kiriyama like looking away from each other and having a conversation with each other as other people walk like between them (laughs) um it's kind of cool I this episode does just kind of end though, and I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> it does. It it's does. Just, as soon as it blows up, we cut to I believe it's Dan smiling, and then just we're done. They, here's the thing. Here's the thing. They could cut like sixty seconds of shooting things very yeah. safely, and it would cost. Listen, that would save them a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and they could use it to shoot like the end of the episode. Um, but they don't. Uh, they they spend all the money on everything shooting shit. Um, I have some notes here from Mel. Um, top one, something I noticed. Why does the captain of the boat that sinks look familiar? Um, I believe he's uh, 
he, we've seen him before on the show. Um, uh, I believe he is uh, the cop from the Kemmer episode. Oh. Um, and he was also in the, what is it, the, the Peter, not the Peter episode, the, the fake Peter episode of Ultraman. Oh, the, um, should we just start the Coast Guard Command? Oh, yeah, wait, no, yeah, that yeah. is the, maybe that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, uh, I believe that's him. Uh, why is Paris the HQ in this universe too? Who keeps putting the world police there? Did they just make Paris the HQ out of force of habit? I think Tsuburaya went to Paris one day and really liked it. I think, I think Tsuburaya really likes Paris. That's fair. I think it's the. I'd like to go there someday. It's, 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 someday. It's, it's the it's the same way. I I have a favorite place in France. <laughs> it's, I, it's, I, so I I think he just went there. I I like Amiens. It's a really nice place in France. It's got a cathedral. It's a Notre Dame cathedral. It's twice the size of the one in Paris, uh, and it's really cool. Um, uh, it was built in a very short time as for cathedrals. It was all built. It was all built under the instruction of the same guy. This history lesson. Didn't need it. Now uh, I know. There you go. Now, you know. now I kind of want to see it. It's good. It's cool. Um, uh, the fishermen uh, run in fear of the Yamato. Uh, I too would run in fear from the ghost of my nation's fascist past in their position. Uh, I got nowhere to go. There's an o There's a sea around me. I can't run that far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, you know... Um, a lot of this episode is looking for things and not finding it, and then uh, a lot of shooting for protracted periods. This is true. Uh, the alien name is Mimi. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Mel's note here. I think a ghost ship and deep sea cat and mouse thriller are cool ideas for an episode, but I kind of feel a bit bored watching it in execution. Um, also, it being yet another alien plot does detract a bit from it. Um, I know it's always aliens in Ultra 7, but a ghost ship seems like a cool Ultra Q type plot. This this is true. The Yamato rising out of the sea would be cooler if it was just the Yamato rising out of the sea. I do agree with that, yeah. Um, uh, Mel, Mel, kind of with you, I don't know. I feel like this episode kind of just happens. Uh, the important stuff. Notes on Iron Rocks. Toru Narita hated designing Iron Rocks, violated his kaiju design principles. My response, Toru Narita, is your kaiju design principles are clearly worth jack shit. Um, I feel like the only time that the kaiju design principles of uh, Narita have come up and I've been like, yes, I agree with this, was the alien spell incident. Yes, that was the one time. Every other time, it's but like every, oh, every other time, it's like, bro, you are so wrong. <laughs> oh, oh, j j oh I, it's wrong to uh, to have designed Jamila. Shut up, nerd. Uh, the the only other thing that I'm with him on is uh, I. Well, I say with him. I mostly just find it kind of funny. I think it's I think it's very funny how much he lost the battle on the color timer. <laughs> um. Uh, the I uh, more notes on this. Uh, the iron rocks prop was made of latex and prone to collapsing. Yeah, I bet. Um, that makes sense. The idea of undersea aliens attacking with a robot battleship originated as an episode concept for Wu before that show got canned in favor of Unbalance. Um, the idea got picked up again for Ultraman and was supposed to feature a battleship kaiju kaiju called Yamaton. <gasps> Yo! This app was, of course, never made, but Yamaton did appear in the concurrently running Ultraman manga. See below. <gasps> Look at this. Oh, shit. I'm going to send you this image. Yeah, please send me Yamaton. I'm sending you Yamaton right now. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose these notes. I'll come back up to them. So, like, they tried to make this story so many times. I never would have guessed. That's fascinating. Look at that. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's better than what we got. I'm. I'll. Yeah. <laughs> I. Oh, I like this. This uh, is cool. It's a uh, uh, for those not looking at the image. Uh, it's a big turtle monster with uh the battleship on its back, <laughs> the the the, the tower and the cannons. Um, 
This is not dissimilar to, uh, I mean, I, obviously it's not a fucking battleship, but the fucking, like, land turtle with the turrets on the back in uh, the Blazer episode a few weeks back. Yes. We got. Yes. This is, yeah, this Tur- is Turns blasters. out, yeah, I was about to say, turns out the Blastoise design philosophy of, of, uh, artillery turtle, g- good. It's just, good combo. it's just, it's just good. <laughs> it just it's works. Just, it just works. Um, we have one final note from Mel for this episode of ultra q capsule countdown 18 episodes in i'm so mad (laughs) oh my god (laughs) they're never coming back they have to they have to uh they're all gonna come back in the last episode and kill ultra 7 for not using them (laughs) for not ever letting them out of the capsules I'm I'm tripling down. Next 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 three. What's gonna show up? <laughs> surely, surely it has to be red eventually. <sighs> it can't can't just keep being the black numbers every time. Uh, but yeah. Um, I mostly uh, I like this episode simply because, um, you know. The, they, they built they built fucking battleship props and used it to blow the fuck out of a, a seaside town. Um, yeah, and, you know, nice fires and explosion effects, and honestly, the miniature works pretty good. Yeah, I you know I turn my brain off, <laughs> clap like a seal, and go hell yeah. <laughs> this this is another classic case of I think the fact that they shot this like in the darkness to like give it that you know like it, it's all like nighttime like effect type stuff or whatever. I think adds a lot. Mm-hmm. Yes absolutely um uh i that that one shot of them i uh, joked about it that one shot of the the submarines firing on the ufo as it flees and they just put the camera directly in front in front of the the cannon (laughs) and just shot a firework straight at the camera lens um it's ridiculous yeah um there's probably like a glass sheet or something in front of it, but I imagine. But you know, I, yeah. I just think it's. Think it looks cool. It looks cool. It's funny. Um. The uh, they got Amagi out and about way more than they used to. He used to seriously be the planning guy. He used to just hang out back at base. Yeah, they got him doing shit. Yeah. Um. Anyway. I don't have much more to say about this episode. Uh, I have a little bit. So again, it was directed by Toshitsugu Suzuki, and then it was written by someone new, but don't get too excited because I don't have a lot to say. Uh, this was written by uh, Onosuke uh, Akai, mm-hmm. who I believe um, only wrote for Ultra 7 this episode okay um and then oh though i actually hear this thing that i have pulled up says that he okay this is interesting uh this says here that oh no okay so he didn't write episode 11 of ultra 7 but he played the role of uh a doctor at the medical center which one was episode 11? 11. 11 is the uh, Fly to Devil Mountain. Oh, right. Oh, it, okay, interesting, actually. This is cool. So there's three doctors. One was him, another was Tetsuo Kinjo, and then the other one was Shozo Uehara. Oh, damn. That's funny. <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. That's cool. Um, But apparently he he wrote for, uh, he wrote some episodes of Mighty Jack, and then this was his one Ultra 7 episode. Um, but there's not really a bunch about this guy. Apparently he's in the Ultra 7 that I loved for a little bit, uh, played by some actor. Uh, and then he wrote for some Kai- or no, sorry, he did assistant directorial work for some kaiju stuff like Mothra vs. Godzilla, mm-hmm. uh, Frankenstein vs. the Underground Monster, and, uh, Godzilla, Ibera, Mothra, Great Duel in the South Seas. Uh-oh. Well, I mean, I guess Mothra is in that territory already, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. Uh, cool. Um, okay. Well, unless we have anything else, I think we can call that a podcast. 
I think we can too. Yeah, that's a reasonable length. Um, plugs. That's what we do. Yes, I remember. I'm, you know, my brain's working properly today. Um, if you want to follow the show, what was that a sentence? Was that words? If you want to follow the show, you can do so at ultra underscore Q on Twitter. That is at ultra underscore Q U E U E. Uh, if you want to follow me, uh, I'm at gender underscore redacted on Twitter. Uh, Rosin. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Rosin Brand, same with co host and Blue Sky. Uh, you can also find me streaming Armored Core 6 on my YouTube channel that is once again Rosin Brand, that is R A S E N B R A N. Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, I want to stream a full playthrough of that game and do all the endings and fun stuff, so. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right. Well, I think we can call that a podcast. Uh, tune in next week. Uh, we will have Mel back. All three of Yay. us. Uh, the Empire divide. Yeah, we can't keep doing this joke. Um, <laughs> uh, three more episodes of Ultra 7. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Capsule Monsters next week, I promise. Nope. Not happening. Love.